the only other note that we have for you is that uh, predictions are that you can expect a two-stage throttle in. Okay, we copy all that, Steve. Thank you. Approximately seven and a half minutes remaining in the built-in hold, and the bottom line of that discussion is that the weather is go at KSC and at Banjul. elements are reporting that they are go so it does appear that we're headed for an 8:47 a.m. Uh, launch we're uh, pulling the mission management team for their concurrence and we have approximately six minutes remaining in this 10 minute built-in hold Countdown resumes, the ground launch sequencer will be in control. This master computer program will issue the commands to perform the final critical tasks that are required to put the space shuttle into the launch configuration. The ground launch sequencer will monitor as many as a thousand different parameters during the final nine minutes to make sure they do not fall out of predetermined limits or red lines. from Launch Director Bob Seek. They go to pick up the countdown at T-minus 9. About 4 minutes, 15 seconds remaining in this hold. All personnel in firing room 1 have now switched over to the same communications channel and will be staying on that channel from now through launch. 4 minutes remaining in the hold. Several major milestones do remain between the pickup of the countdown and launch. As we come out of the hole, the ground launch sequencer takes over control and issues commands for the final critical task. At T minus 7 minutes and 30 seconds, the orbiter access arm retraction will be performed. And at T minus 5 minutes, pilot Charlie Bolden will start up the orbiter's auxiliary power units. A gimbal check of the orbiter's aero surfaces will occur at the T minus 3 minute 55 second mark and an engine gimbal test occurs at the 3 minute, three minute 25 second mark. For the status at Mission Control in Houston, we'll now switch to the Johnson Space Center for their status. Uh, CNSC, OTC. 
This is Mission Control in Houston. All positions in the Mission Control Center are reporting they are ready for launch, and the weather is looking good. Our only previous, our only previous concern had been uh, crosswind weather at the Tau site. So we are uh, standing by for launch. This is Mission Control. We'll go now to the Space Telescope Operations Control Center at Goddard. This is Hubble Telescope Control in Greenbelt at T minus nine minutes and holding. Uh, the Director of Orbital Verification, Mike Harrington, has confirmed that all control team positions here in the Space Telescope Operations Control Center in Maryland, as well as the support team at the Huntsville Operations Support Center in Alabama, are ready for today's uh, launch of the Hubble Space Telescope. Presently, the telescope is essentially powered down in Discovery's cargo bay, with the exception of three discrete uh, power sources going to keep the transmitters or correction receivers on board the telescopes, the gyros uh, warm, and uh, the receivers ready to receive commands uh, once we uh, get on orbit. First commands to be sent from here will be about four hours and 30 minutes mission elapsed time. Again, all is ready here in the control center at the Goddard Space Flight Center and in the uh, Huntsville Operations Support Center at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama. At T minus nine minutes and holding, this is Hubble Telescope Control in Greenbelt. We now have approximately one minute remaining in this 10 minute built in hold. The countdown clock will start in one minute. Mission Management Team Chairman Brewster Shaw has completed the poll of his team and they verify that they are ready for launch. now counting T minus nine minutes. The ground launch sequencer is now controlling. It is very quiet here in the Launch Control Center because there is nothing to discuss. We are ready to fly. DLT OTC, head of ground one. Let's stand. Can you configure a fuel cell essential bus door switches, please? Captain Wood. OTC DLT, essential buses are connected to fuel cells. Thank you. The orbiter test conductor is now requesting that Houston flight controller send stored program commands, which are the final update on antenna management. This update ensures that the orbiter has the latest information to communicate with the different ground tracking stations as the vehicle moves downrange. Entity flight 212. Go ahead, fly. Okay, we're sending our SPCs. T minus seven minutes and 30 seconds. Access arm retract. The orbiter crew access arm is now being retracted away from the vehicle into the launch configuration. This arm can be re-extended to the crew compartment in less than 30 seconds should a contingency occur. T minus seven minutes and counting.
T minus six minutes, 30 seconds and counting. You want to start APU and hydraulic strip chart recorders, please. Recorder starting. Coming up in about 15 seconds, the orbiter test conductor will give pilot Charlie Boland a go, a go to perform the auxiliary power unit pre-start operations. DLT, OTC, 212. Yes, sir. You may perform APU pre-start, please. That's in work, Stan. And Bolden now will configure those switches in the cockpit to put the APUs in the ready-to-start position. Waiting his reply that that is complete. OTC, PLT, APU pre starts complete, the big gray top backs. Thank you. Holden reports that the APU pre start is complete, and console engineers here in the launch control center are able to confirm that. The APU activation will come at T minus five minutes and about 15 seconds. The APUs provide hydraulic power to the orbiter. Five seconds now from APU pre-start uh, start operations. Let's go for orbiter APU start. PLT OTC 212. Where's PLT go? You may perform APU start. That's in work. And Commander Schreiber now given a go for the APU start. CDR, OTC. CDR, go ahead. You uh, and, uh, I'd like to report, uh, Roger, we have uh, at an intermittent uh, APU speed high on APU-1. Intermittent on APU-1. Intermittent on APU-1. Uh, Roger, copy. A discussion from because it was up there anyway. Captain clock is holding at T-minus four minutes due to a failure. The clock will hold now at T-minus four. We are investigating a problem with APU number one. Yeah, we recommend just hold and analyze at this moment. We're holding good in the high speed range right now, ranging from 112 to about 118. The clock is in a precautionary hold so that we have time to assess the situation and discuss it. Standing by for a recommendation from the console engineers. Discussion now about the chamber pressures on the SRBs. And OTC, CDI, I did not do my heaters. Uh, if you decide to uh, resume count, I'll get those. Copy that. APU apparently looked good in high speed, but not in low, and that is being discussed. And it is the APU. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Can I speak to PLT for a moment? Go ahead. Yes, sir. PLT, um, were you seeing getting uh, alarms of high speed? That's why you shifted it to high speed? That's primitive. Uh, uh, APU, we were, the speed seemed to be controlling or not controlling is running randomly from normal up to about 114, and we switch to high, and it stays, uh, it's controlling in the high-speed range. I got the NTD. What we'd like to do is take it back into the normal speed and see if the speed sensors and the controller will hold it in the normal speed range. SP, NTD. SP, concurs. Go ahead, APU. Yeah, PLT, I'd like to go ahead and take the uh, speed select switch on APU number one to normal. Okay, that's in work. Okay, we have APU-1 in normal speed. That's one instructor. Okay, recommend that we count down to 31. Uh, why don't you do that? Proceed to 31 and hold there until we get a, uh, a total go on this condition. Bruce
Brewster Shaw and the chairman of the mission management team and launch director Bob Seek are discussing the possibility of continuing to account down to T minus 31 to keep our options open. GLS pick up immediately. And MTDSSD will have to uh, bypass this parameter. Understand? Go ahead, APU. Yes, sir. Um, the the current speed for System One is not holding within range, and from the RPS readings that we're getting from the strip charts, we're also seeing that the chamber pressure is erratic in System One. And right now, our recommendation has to be no go. And the uh, violation is LCC 6.6-6. And SD. SD concurs. And launch director concurs. Uh, APU before we uh, we call it quits here. Is there any more data you would like to get in our current configuration before we would go into a recycle and a shutdown? And launch director, this APU. No, we have our strip charts downstairs, and we have all the data we need for right now. Okay, copy. Uh, SD. SD concurs. And NTD. Let's get cut off. GLS get cut off. Copy. Launch team, proceed to sequence 18, page 978. And a decision from launch director Bob Seek that we will scrub for today because of a problem with auxiliary power unit number one, observed by Commander Lowen Shriver. When commanding the APUs to start at the T minus five minute mark. The orbiter access arm has been returned to position around the crew access hatch. Go ahead, NTD. We are now into the recycle procedure. The vehicle is being saved. And we will now have an analysis of the data and look at our options. APU engineers report that we have had a good APU shutdown as part of our saving procedures. OTCT LT APU shutdown is complete. Copy that. On panel R2. Ready. APU hydraulic, hydraulic start pump 1, 2, and 3, switch it to GPC. It's ready, Tom. And that's verified out there in GPC. Copy. NTD flight 212. Go ahead, flight. The BFS SPC buffer is clear and we're ready for the G9 transition. Copy, thank you. GLS primary spacing is complete and we are going for transition to G9. Copy. We do not have a decision yet on how long the scrub will be. The launch team continues to save the vehicle and the mission management team and launch director Bob Seek are discussing it. That's complete. And DLT, panel R1. Go ahead. Power distribution of central bus source, fuel cell 1, 2, and 3 switches to off. That's complete. And panel F8. Ready. Flight controller power switch to off. That's complete. And CGSS OTC. Go ahead. Verify OAA is extended, locked, and configured for retract. Thank you, sir. Right
Welcome to our STS-31 launch delay briefing. Our panelists from your left are Robert B. Seek, KSC launch director, and Fred Wotalik. The spelling on that is W-O-J-T-A-L-I-K, HST project manager for the Marshall Space Flight Center, and we'll start off with Bob Seek. Well, we're obviously disappointed to have scrubbed the, uh, the Hubble launch today. We had a, a good launch count going right down into the terminal count. And at minus five minutes, we, uh, we start the orbiter auxiliary power units. These are the units that pressurize the hydraulic system on the orbiter. And they're used, the, the system is used to steer uh, the orbiter in the atmospheric flight as well as the, uh, the engine controls and the, and the landing gear system. So they're obviously mandatory uh, for the mission. And it appears when we started uh, unit number one, there was an internal failure, a valve, which failed to respond properly. It, uh, it let too much fuel go into the, uh, to the unit, which caused an overspeed condition. The, the logic circuitry in the APU sensed the overspeed and, and took over from that standpoint, just as it would do in flight. Uh, we subsequently switched the unit back to normal speed re-verified that the failure was still there and, and then initiated the, uh, the scrub. We're still reviewing a lot of information from this uh, unit, but that's what the preliminary indication is. It's an internal failure. It was one of those things that uh, picked that time to fail, and, uh, and that's where we are. Uh, we do know that the sense logic in the controller worked, and that's good as it should. Uh, and our launch commit criteria safeguards, which monitors for the overspeed condition, puts an automatic hold into the system and, and stop the count at minus four minutes. Uh, that, that all worked. Uh, we don't like to find problems late in the launch count. Uh, these particular <coughs> units, though, do not lend themselves to check out in this, uh, in this configuration. During ground turnaround, we essentially buy them off for the next mission based on their performance in the previous mission, which was good for this unit. Uh, however, when we have problems, we do like to find them on the ground, uh, and that part of the system worked. We're not sure what the impact of this is yet. We're still assessing the timelines to uh, change out and retest the, the unit. We have to integrate that with the Hubble requirements uh, because of their batteries. And this particular unit, we do not have a large experience base for doing the change out at the launch pad, and it's in the aft fuselage. So we have to put the access in there and, uh, and work those procedures. So it's going to take time to uh, sort that out, and we don't have a specific target <coughs> for a new launch date, but it's going to be uh, probably between a week to two weeks down the road. And uh, we're going to be smarter on that in the next couple of days when we refine our schedules. Fred? As far as the Hubble's concerned, it was ready for launch. It uh, currently was on a uh, agreement based on battery discharge curves that uh, were verified by laboratory tests that we could support four consecutive launch attempts. Uh, that's four consecutive days where launch attempts would be tried. Uh, based on what Bob just stated, it appears that we'll exceed that particular scenario and therefore we've got to come up with some sort of a schedule that will allow us to recharge the batteries and get them back up to at least 62 ampere hours which will then allow us to again support four consecutive days of uh, launch attempts. There are two current scenarios that are being discussed and at this time I can't tell you which one is going to be picked. We have one that uh, allows us to charge at the pad which was our baseline entry that if we ever exceeded the four consecutive days we would recharge at the pad. Since the APU system apparently has to come out, uh, there's another scenario that's being discussed which would say take the batteries out, take them to the battery lab and charge them there and then at the last minute approximately a day or so possibly for L-68 again, bring them back, put them into the Hubble, and proceed for a launch attempt again on 68 hours later. We would at that time be able to support again you know, four consecutive days of launch attempts. There is no danger of anything uh, being a problem because of this. Uh, everyone 
uh, has seen this uh, as far as the discharge curves. We're tracking uh, all of that currently by analysis since we cannot see pressures uh, from the batteries since power is off the vehicle. But we have data that says they are tracking based on temperature and currently uh, had we launched this morning we would have been over the uh, launch constraint for a launch which is 285 ampere hours for first day launch. We had 299 as our estimate based on temperatures that the batteries have been kept uh, while they've been uh, after charging here in the, in the vehicle. The CAPE uh, people have uh, done very well in being able to keep us at the lower end of the uh, temperature curve which uh, retains as much charge as possible. These batteries are essentially small pressure vessels and therefore pressure if heated will cause it to rise and that causes faster discharge. So we're asking for a, a cool temperature, sufficiently cold to stay within our box of, of known knowledge and uh, they were doing that very well. So I have no you know, concerns for us being able to recycle in uh, the best scenario that satisfies the orbiter, the Kennedy folks, and also the Hubble. But I can't tell you at this time what that particular scenario will be. It does appear, however, that we will not be able to uh, go, I guess, for about a week. And in that time frame, both of the uh, types of charging either in the battery lab or on board the vehicle at the pad are uh, amenable to uh, that type of a schedule. That's all I We're have We're open this for time. questions at this time. When recognized, please wait for the mic. Give your name and affiliation. Down front here, please, Chet. Uh, press the button, please. Well, I need, I don't prefer one over the other. At this point in time, they uh, they both would be acceptable. The uh, the going to the lab has some uh, capability for the cape rel relative to flexibility that uh, they wouldn't have if we were at the pad. For example, after if I understand correctly, after the uh, APUs are installed, there is a hot firing period, and that means that people would have to vacate the pad area. That means the people watching the charge cart would have to go, and again, we'd end up with some period of discharging because we'd be open circuit without power trying to charge the batteries. So that means they have to pay us back for that, and there are some periods of a day or day or so to recharge the battery for what we lost for that hazardous operation we weren't, when we weren't there. The battery lab, of course, gets us out of the way. It allows us to uh, cool the batteries down to 32 degrees Fahrenheit, where they'll take a charge very readily, and allows us then to pump them in, in with energy so that the, they'll have a higher starting point and uh, can sustain the amount of time it takes to take them from the battery lab and you know, put them on board and sustain the 68 hours of uh, open circuit again and proceed with the launch. You end up, in both cases, about at the same point relative to uh, amount of charge at liftoff. And as I say, the uh, agreement and all of the scenarios that we set up were that we could sustain four days and we would do it in either case. Jay. Jay Barbary with NBC. Bob, uh, in tomorrow morning's meeting, do you expect to come up with a firm launch date? Do you think that launch date will be closer to two weeks than one week? And also, what does this impact have to do on uh, Astrolab follow-up uh, missions coming up in May? Well, I don't, I don't want to uh, speculate what the what the schedule is going to look like uh, uh, because we've got a lot of work to do on that, and obviously we have to assess the options here, what looks best in terms of the uh, uh, the Hubble scenario. So it's. Uh, I wouldn't speculate whether it's closer to one week or two weeks, but I think we, we'll be close to a no earlier than target sometime within the next couple of days. And in terms of what that does to the next mission for discovery, uh, we also have to look at that and, and right now don't know what, if any, the impact would be due to this delay. Dan. Dan Billow, WESH-TV. Uh, Fred, what are your concerns about uh, any contamination over the next couple of weeks? And would taking out the batteries and, and uh, taking them to a lab 
uh, increase the risk of contamination at all? Well, we are certainly concerned about contamination every day that, uh, that we're here on Earth. Uh, we will do everything that we have done in the past to ensure that uh, we take care of any problem like that. And uh, taking the batteries out to the battery lab does not increase the risk at all. Before they'd be brought back into the vehicle, they will be thoroughly cleaned in an airlock situation, uh, meaning that we will clean them before we bring them into the PCR to be put on board the Hubble. Uh, no problems as far as uh, final condition that the Hubble will be in. It will take us uh, time, and it will be done very deliberately, and we'll ensure that we don't je you know, jeopardize our uh, condition as we are currently. We may be having a glitch with the mic over here. Let's try it again. Morton. Yeah, Morton, ABC News. Bob, a couple of questions. One, uh, because of the excessive fuel flowing through the unit, does that put the uh, ship or the crew in any danger? And number two, could this problem have occurred during the ascent or descent? And if so, what would it have uh, meant? Well, on the, the first item, uh, no, because the, the secondary speed control system, as it should, uh, sensed the overspeed, kicked in, and maintained it at a safe level of speed. Uh, and it would do that on the ground just as well as it would in flight. And had it occurred in flight, that's exactly what would have happened. Uh, now, the impact on the mission, I think that that's a good question, better directed toward Johnson and the flight operations people. Sue. Sue Butler, Time Magazine and Daytona Beach News Journal. May I come back to the batteries once more? Uh, before the APU problem cropped up, we had conflicting stories that the batteries are, do not hold the charge very well. Instead of something like, uh, I don't know, 68 or 70 amp hours, they could only be brought up to 63. Is it true? And <coughs> do you anticipate? problems or maybe we will get other batteries. What are you planning? Originally we came down with uh, hopes of getting to 70 ampere hours. Uh, due to the temperature we didn't get there and if we looked at the test data that we have the batteries did exactly what they were supposed to do. They, they took a charge very rapidly to the 60 ampere hour regime in, in roughly almost you know, a day and then after that they uh, they start to take the charge slower and slower. As you get higher in pressure and cannot get down in temperature, uh, you know, we have a condition here where you've got humidity and you can't totally freeze these batteries, which they would uh, essentially like, you know, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, and you'd get water and you get moisture. So we don't want to get to the below the dew point. So we got down as far as we could, but it wasn't at that time far enough and we were taking a charge very slowly. It's just a matter of time under those conditions when it would have gotten to uh, you know, 70 ampere hours, but it was more time than we wanted to, to devote to this process. So uh, we did change the on-orbit uh, scenarios as to what we did. We became more efficient by taking a few operations in parallel. And because of that, 62 ampere hours was acceptable to us for the four consecutive launch attempts that we originally came in with. And that's the way we went. And we're currently saying that if we can get back to 62 and with these things we're doing on orbit, we'll be in the same condition. But the batteries did exactly what they, you know, should do. There was nothing wrong with them. They take a charge and uh, on orbit they will be very good for the uh, scientific community because they are a higher battery per given volume relative to energy and they allow m much more flexibility in an operation sense. Uh, we previously were going to fly Hubble with 55 ampere hour batteries. These will be flying in the 75 regime we get on orbit, and we can do a lot more things and uh, be more flexible. But they, uh, they operate very well. They did exactly what we expected. John, hold your hand up, please. Uh, John Wilford, New York Times. Bob, there's a big difference between one week and two weeks. Could you give us some feeling for what, what factors would make you feel comfortable with a one week uh, launch date and some of the factors that might cause it to slip to two weeks? Well, the, for the one week, we would, uh, we would have to develop a timeline for changing out this unit, which we do not have a history base for in the vertical at the pad that showed that it could be done in uh, a couple of shifts of work out there. 
which is highly unlikely because there's a number of fittings and, and there's hazards involved with those fittings because of hydrazine. But we're looking at that. Uh, also, uh, one of the keys is going to be the integration of our work uh, with the work that Fred has to do with the batteries and selecting the option, which from a best overall timeline and less risk to hardware and schedule, uh, meets the earliest opportunity, be it removal of the batteries or keeping the batteries on board and doing the charging that he talked about. Uh, that that would be the road to the least impact and it's our initial projection that the worst case for our timelines for the APU and the integration with the battery charging requirements would be the two week and that week difference we hope to have down to with a, a couple of days of uncertainty by tomorrow. John. Uh, John, Gl John Glish from the Orlando Sentinel. Bob, I want to kind of follow up on that la last question. Can you give us an, an idea of just how physically difficult it is going to be for these guys in there to get in there and do the work? I mean, do they go in through the aft end, up through the engine compartment? Do they work? Do they uh, yank the unit out uh, uh, in the cargo bay? If so, there's just a, not a real large space between that aft bulkhead and the back end of, uh, uh, of Hubble. Can you kind of give us a feel for that and also uh, uh, for the Hubble folks any possible dangers that you folks might be concerned about to the telescope damage I don't know wrenches scaffolding or whatever uh, while it well for the uh, for the orbiter unit the uh, the job will be straightforward once we get access and it is in the aft fuselage of the orbiter we remove the access doors put in a, a, what we call a standard <laughs> vertical platform set uh, the unit is, uh, is, is fairly large, about uh, four square feet, and uh, we have to get you the exact weight, but uh, it's, it's over 100 pounds, so we have a fixture that we would have to put in there and bolt to the, uh, the brackets that have been provided for that service. Uh, there's electrical disconnections and there's uh, hydrazine connections lines which have to be safe and inerted before we can do that job so the people would have to have on protective clothing uh, to in order to do all of this work and then it's a it's a removal out and then bring in the new unit uh, and repeat that process and then run through a test to validate the electrical and the fluid connections uh, in terms of degree of difficulty uh, the standard critical processes that we do down here every day apply, but in terms of familiarity with this unit in the vertical position, we don't have a large experience base, and that's why the uncertainty. We'll take one more question here before we move off to other centers. Gentlemen in the front row. Doug Isbell with Space News. I had two questions for Bob. Um, can you give us a little history of this, of this APU, how many flights it's made, and <coughs> what kind of lifetimes they have? And also, there was a mention of a problem with the solid rocket motor, a booster. Was that a real problem uh, during the hold? The, uh, well, the, the units, uh, I think we're going to have to uh, have these people work on your, your question on the history of the, uh, of the APUs. Overall, they've been, uh, they've been good to us. Uh, we have never had one uh, fail during a, a critical portion of the flight, uh, ascent or descent. We did have on STS-9 uh, during the landing rollout phase uh, a failure in one or two of the units. Uh, there's a lot of, of uh, history on them. Similar units also fly on the solid rocket boosters, as you know, and provide the same function, uh, which is steering controls uh, and the thrust vector control system. So uh, we're going to have to get you the particulars. Uh, but overall, they've been reliable, but they are known critical high energy uh, system. Do we have a question at the Goddard Space Flight Center? This is Goddard, uh, A.R. Hogan, Writers Plus. I have two questions, actually. First question is, what specific factors determine the opening time, the duration, and the closing time of the Hubble launch window? And will it be at approximately the same time of day if, if you delay one or two weeks? And I have a second question. Well, I think uh, we're... And in terms of the, the closing time, it's, it's, the, uh, it's the sunlight uh, 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 overseas in the, in, the, in the event of a transatlantic abort. The opening part of the window, uh, we're going to have to take that question and work that with the, with the Johnson Flight Ops people. Uh, but in terms of change, uh, only a few minutes a day. 
Uh, so an attempt a week to two weeks from now is not going to be that much different time there, today. There is a chart available on that which we can fax up to. Uh, any more questions, Scotty? Uh, yes, I have a second question. Um, this, this is not uh, related to, to specifically to the scrub, but when the, uh, the Saturn V Skylab space station was launched in 73, there was uh, damage incurred to the solar panels. And I'm wondering what modifications have been made or has that factored into your thinking of how the Hubble solar arrays are protected and why couldn't that happen again? And could you explain a little bit about comparing uh, the, the solar panels on, on Skylab and, and Hubble and, uh, and what, what changes have been made over the last uh, 50 years? Well, I think you've gotten into an area that uh, one can really start to talking about speculation and such. Uh, these particular panels were built by ESA. They've flown before on other vehicles as far as that particular design. This configuration of that design is probably the largest that has ever been uh, flown. Uh, we don't expect from all the testing that we've seen on these relative to acoustics, dynamics analysis, thermal analysis, uh, vacuum under vacuum conditions and all that, and safety margins applied to the loads that they are going to see when they uh, are launched, that we will have any problems with them. The uh, units are large once they're unfurled. At the uh, current configuration, they look relatively small. They open up like a, a sort of like a window shade, except it comes out at both ends when the command is given for the second deployment mechanism to unfurl. Uh, once open, they'll be uh, 40 feet long and 8 feet across, and there'll be two of them. No, we do not expect to see any problems with them. They are a different configuration than Skylab. Skylab was uh, not a... Uh, an unfurled design of this type. It was more of an, a large accordion set of panels. Do we have a question at the Johnson Space Center? This is Craig Cavalt with Aviation Week for Bob Seek. Bob, does the en entire APU poll have to be done with the technicians in scape suits? Uh, no, once we inert the, uh, the lines of liquid, uh, we do that in what we call a, a breathing air uh, and protective clothing apparatus. Uh, Resurfacing of the system, which is one of the things we're looking at, uh, is escape suit operation. And on, on the point of servicing, I recall about nine years ago on STS-2, there was a serious APU problem in about the last minute of the count. Was the difference there that you just replaced a component on STS-2 as opposed to replacing the whole APU? The, uh, well, I don't recall all the, uh, the specifics of that one. Uh, it was not the same type of failure. Uh, we saw an indication there, I believe, of, uh, of internal leakage through a, a seal, and, uh, and that was a different uh, type of failure scenario than we're talking about here. The discussion, you were pretty specific that you had a valve failure. Do you actually have uh, have real data that says a particular valve failed, or are you inferring a valve failed from what you see in them? Well, the uh, Craig, the, the the signature, as it were, of the information, which is the the pressure in the uh, the gas bed generator, would indicate that uh, the pulse valve, which is a uh, a primary speed control valve, normally open. Uh, uh, did not fully close in the startup phase uh, and as a result let too much hydrazine in in that particular cycle and that's what caused the overspeed. That's again based on the uh, the signature that we have we're still looking at that data and obviously the real uh, analysis won't be complete until we get the unit out of the ship and back to the vendor and uh, tear it down. We're back at KSC for questions. Mark? Mark Kramer, CBS. Uh, for Bob Seek, uh, have you seen this kind of problem in other APU problems in earlier missions? And secondly, where does the replacement come from? Is it off the shelf or is it a cannibalization? The uh, failures of this, we're going to have to uh, to answer that with more than I can remember off the top of my head on the failure because that would include the tests that were done on units at the vendor as well as uh, as online. Uh, again, though, I can relate that in terms of in-flight performance, this has is, is not been a frequent uh, uh, bad actor. And a replacement unit, we're looking at two options. Uh, there's one that we just received uh, for Atlantis, uh, which was intended to go to Atlantis, and the next one is, 
is a few days to a week down the line and we're looking at that schedule. But we will have a spare to put in when we get the old one out. Kathy? Can you hold your hand up, Kathy, please? Kathy Sawyer, The Washington Post. I'm still not clear on exactly how close the physical work is going to be going around, going on around the Space Telescope. And after all those years in million dollar clean rooms, billion dollar clean rooms, why isn't there more concern about it sitting on the ground in this not so clean cargo bay for a week or two weeks more? Well, I'll ad address the, uh, the access. We're separated by a major structural bulkhead uh, at the aft end of the payload bay where the APU and all of our high energy systems are from the clean environment that we try to maintain for Hubble. So we're not concerned about aft fuselage contamination migrating uh, into the Hubble territory as we refer it. Oh, one, one second, Kathy. How clean relatively is it inside the cargo bay compared to the, say, the, the, the clean room that it's been kept in, in a, ba a bag, as I understand it, here at the Cape? Well, it's without saying that the payload uh, cargo bay is not a 10 you know, K class clean room or better, as we've kept the Hubble, for example, at Sunnyvale and uh, in other places we've uh, maintained it below 2,000 class. But it depends a lot on the time of exposure. And we stayed out in Sunnyvale, as you know, for several years. Uh, the time we were in the uh, VPF was longer than we intend to stay in the payload bay of the, of the shuttle. The shuttle payload bay is clean. It's been uh, treated very carefully. People have done an awful lot to make it probably the cleanest you know, payload bay that's uh, ever carried a payload. And we're not uh, deeply concerned in staying there for the period of time that we're talking about. Should we have to you know, open up the uh, payload bay, there's considerations right now to uh, you know, reapply the uh, aperture door, the protective cover. Sometimes we call it a beanie cap, but it is a plastic covering that set, covers the portion of the payload bay that doesn't totally close the, uh, the separation between uh, it and the, the light shield. There's about an inch and a half to two inches of, of, of space there. Again, depending on how long we stay in that condition, uh, we would uh, then evaluate and determine whether we have to take precautions. But I'm not, and none of the contamination people we have in the program are concerned for the period that we're talking about. We'll Su do things right. Susan, can you hold your hand up for the lady, please, for the mic? Susan Cole, WCPX TV Orlando. Um, Bob, can you give us the reaction of the astronauts and tell us what their schedule is going to be like during this um, stand down period? Well, not not sure. Based, it, it'll it'll be based a lot on what uh, the stand down time is going to be in terms of uh, of quarantine and uh, return to Houston. We're going to be smarter uh, on that tomorrow. And in terms of their reaction, I think it's like everybody in this room and all around the the, uh, the country that support the program. Everybody's disappointed. Jim. Jim, <clears throat> excuse me, Jim Banky, Florida Today. I guess I have the same question for both sides. Bob, have you have you done the APU changeout on the pad before? And in terms of the telescope, do you have to do anything to move it to get access to the batteries? Have you practiced that procedure before? The in terms of the APU as that module, we have not changed that at the launch pad before. In the in the processing facility, horizontal is our only experience base. And again, that's why we hedge on the timeline. Get smarter on it. The Hubble can fly with uh, nickel cadmiums, which was the baseline battery set, and uh, also nickel hydrogens. Uh, we did put the nickel hydrogens on board at Sunnyvale. It was a fit check after the uh, first modules came off the line that were available to do that. So we have procedures that have been used to put these modules on board at a high level uh, above the you know ground position that they, uh, that they are in the equipment section. We also took them out of the battery lab here at Kennedy after they were delivered and uh, proceeded to put them into the vehicle at the VPF. We took the test NICADs out and put the nickel hydrogens in and so we've done this at least a couple of times. 
We're not, uh, you know, concerned about not having the proper uh, procedures in place. They will have to be modded slightly in order to cover the little differences in the PCR over the VPF or Sunnyvale, but that will be done. The people that have done this before are still available to us and the tools are as well. So either way, charging them in the payload or taking them out can be done. And uh, I'm not concerned about it. John. John Zarella, CNN. For Bob, uh, how many hours? You have about 22 hours on the APUs running before they have to be changed out or rechecked. Uh, do you know whether these APUs were scheduled to go back in for refurbishing? Uh, and, and also, when do you expect to have the, the new APUs online? I'm sure you'd like to have them this week. Well, the, the, uh, I don't have the specifics, John, on, the, uh, on when these were targeted to come out. Uh, it was not the next turnaround of this, uh, this flow. And uh, the timeline on the new units, uh, it's at least a year away. I'm told we're getting back close to back to work time, and we have time for one more question. Harry? Uh, Mr. Wiltalek, the uh, when you started out, you said you would have had 285 to 299 amp hours. Is that six batteries divided into that for each battery? That's correct. The, okay. uh, the launch mission rule says that we should have at least 285 ampere hours in the battery set, which is comprised of six batteries. We have two modules. Each module contains three batteries. The estimate based on temperatures at this point in time was 299 was available to us uh, at the launch time had it occurred. We're out of time. That wraps up the news conference. Thank you for coming. We do have two local announcements when we get off the satellite.